Amen. You know, I love the way God works. As we have been going through the Gospel of Matthew, as you know, uh, we ended up last week at the end of chapter 9, where Jesus declares, in fact, the very end of the chapter, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And next week, we're going to see how he is going to send his own disciples out into that harvest, going to the lost sheep of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. Go to your people. And we emphasize around here the importance of going to our worlds, those people that God has brought into our lives. Well, today, we have the pleasure and opportunity of hearing from one of our missionaries that we have been supporting for a number of years now, uh, come and share with us how he is going into his world. And so, Al Fadi is with us this morning. Come on up. Let's give him a welcome. And... Uh, it's taken a few years. Uh, we were scheduled to have him come and preach uh, back in 2020, and then uh, the world closed. That's right. <laughs> so it's taken a few years to get him back, but uh, Al, looking forward to hearing how we can transform our culture with truth. Amen. So, uh, thank you, Pastor. Well, thank you so much, everyone. What a privilege, really, to be here. I've been here once before, and indeed, we were in the planning uh, for me to come in in 2020 and something strange happened that stopped all of us from even connecting with each other, never, never mind the world. Uh, of course, thank you so much for your hospitality. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for your support. You have no idea how the Lord is using you through our ministry to reach places I guarantee you you've probably never, ever been to, like the Arabian Peninsula just in a generic way. If you want to know more details, of course, you are more than welcome to come and talk to me after I'm done. Now, today's uh, message, really, that the Lord put on my heart has to do with the story of the Samaritan woman and her encounter with the Savior of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I called it Transforming Culture with Truth, Lessons from the Story of the Samaritan Woman. Now, when we say, um, uh, basically, culture, sometimes we think of culture, sadly, as possibly a group of people who are really not friendly with us, or maybe we think that we're enemies with each other. Let me give you a humorous story here. Uh, a young lady, basically, in her teens year, uh, got in trouble with her family, and they basically asked her not to sit with them at the table for dinner that day and to sit just on the side to think about what she has done. And they gave her, of course, her meal. And uh, as they began to eat, she looked at the table and reflected on Psalm 23 and said the following, Thank you, Lord, for providing me with my meal in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> Sometimes that's how it goes. We look at people near us, and instead of really trying to learn more about them, maybe knock on their door, maybe approach them, maybe try to find a common bridge to build connection and communicate the gospel to them, we hesitate. We feel like, what if they reject me? What if they don't want to hear me? What if they are not interested? in connecting with me. And we make all these assumptions, and trust me, it is the enemy of the gospel that always wants you to think this way. But let us learn lessons from what our Lord Himself has done. Now, when Jesus ascended to heaven, by the way, He didn't get to heaven and say, okay, you guys are free now to do whatever you want. No, He gave us a mission, gave us a calling. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth was, were given to me, Therefore, because of that authority, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, Jesus, by the way, is not surprised that when you go to nations or cultures in this case, that you are going to encounter things that you're not accustomed to. And that's the beauty, by the way, about cultures, is that it will force you to learn about certain things that possibly you may have never imagined to learn. Even words sometimes. I'm involved in Bible translation. One of the things that I do, I am so privileged to have this honor of taking the Word of God and translating it into the dialect of my people. But when I got married to my wife, she is from North Africa. She's from Morocco. And 
when we gave birth to my daughter about 15 years ago, my mother-in-law came and joined us. And there was a word that I use in my culture that has to do with wishing someone not only health, but also wishing them he, uh, basically to be whole in terms of like no illness. But the word that I used with my mother-in-law turned out to be wishing her to be burned in the hellfire. So you can imagine the encounter first time with my mother-in-law. But it was a valuable lesson for me to be careful next time and consult with my advisor, also known as my wife, before I say anything. All that to say is that that's the beauty about culture. It's like when you encounter people, you wonder sometimes, what if I said this? Are they going to really understand it the way I meant it? And actually, I invite people always to ask people, how would you say this? How would you approach this? How would you honor people in your culture? And you'll be surprised how people are going to get overly excited to share things with you. And that's some of the things that I usually train others to do, just to basically pave the way for living Christ before them and hopefully also sharing Christ with them. In this particular story, by the way, found in the Gospel of John chapter 4, verses 1 to 41, to be specific, Jesus took an amazing step to be intentional in sharing the Gospel with no other than a group of people known as the Samaritans, whom were hated by the Jews of his days, and the Samaritans also shared the same feeling against the Jews. So you can imagine the reaction that the Samaritan woman had when Jesus approached her. What does it mean, by the way, to transform something? According to the Oxford Dictionary, is to make a thorough, notice, make a thorough or dramatic change in the form or appearance or character of someone or culture or something. And in this story, I think you are going to see how our Lord modeled that for us. So put yourself right now in the uh, story itself, in this plot, and ask yourself, do I know someone from a different culture? And by the way, these days, our very own young generation appear to be from a whole different culture than ours, okay? They come up with their own ways and ideas of thinking about things. So right there, you can at least initiate a step to understanding where our youth is coming from. I had the privilege of teaching a lot of youngsters in college. I call them 13th graders, and they are 13th graders, trust me. And I've lost a lot of hair trying to figure them out. But at the end of the day, what a joy it is to make a spiritual impact in their life. And I hope that they see the love that I have for them. Above all, the love of our Lord through us towards them. In this story, I'm going to start by giving you lesson number one or step number one. We need to look beyond cultural clashes or conflicts. Jesus really didn't say, okay, well, it's the tradition of my days that you don't go through Samaria. You just go around and probably prolong your trip. Remember, he was in Jerusalem, and the Pharisees really did not like a whole lot about Jesus. And now he is going back to Galilee and want to continue with his mission. And later on, of course, he'll come down to Jerusalem. And obviously, the final trip to Jerusalem was to go to the cross. But when he was doing this, he decided to go point blank through Samaria. In John 4, starting from verse 3, it reads the following. He left Judea and went away again to Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Really, the English doesn't even do you well because Jesus was intentional. Nothing forced him to go through Samaria, by the way. There were other routes that would have allowed him to go around. But he intentionally went through. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sikhar, near the parcel of land that Jacob... What an interesting name because Jacob is Israel that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and, jo and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, tired from his journey, was just sitting by the well. Notice the language. He was just sitting by the well. 
In other words, he was strategic. He's waiting for someone to come in. And of course, our Lord knew that there was a person in need to hear the gospel. And that should be our attitude. If you go to places, pray and ask God to bring the right person to have an encounter with, to begin to share the truth with them. So Jesus, tired of his journey, was just sitting by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, he didn't have to go, like I said, through Samaria. This was a deliberate choice by our Lord. Now, he looked beyond hatred, racial issues, discrimination, and was seeking a lost soul. When we meet with people from other cultures, we are to look at them as people who are made in the image of God. People in the world that God loved them so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for them. People that they need to hear the truth that will set them free, the spiritual truth. To make, by the way, friends in cultures, to transform cultures, we must give priority to people first. Lay aside agendas, lay aside ideologies, lay aside traditions that usually are man-made traditions, by the way, that mean nothing to God. God doesn't look at boundaries, by the way. Jesus didn't say, therefore, go and make disciples and make sure you carry your passports with you and pay the fees and cross the borders, but if someone turns you down, just forget him, let him die. No, he's expecting us to reach every single culture and nations. In fact, that they, uh, goes all the way back to the promise that was given to Abraham, that in you, in you, notice, in you, the seed that will be coming from you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. We, as the descendants of Abraham, the spiritual descendants of Abraham, we carry that burden of blessing others, of course, through Christ. Jesus was direct. Jesus was strategic. In verses 7 to 9, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, notice, he immediately opened the door for a conversation. And I tell people, they always ask me, okay, so, well, I do have a lot of Muslim friends. And, of course, that's my, uh, my ministry. I always train people on how to reach Muslims for Christ. And uh, I, I don't know how to open the door for them. And it breaks my heart when someone tells me, I've been in their country for five years, and I have yet to share the gospel with them. Oh, my goodness. Five years. I am so thankful that the pe person is still alive, didn't die. Because if that person died, you would have been the only one that God brought to their life to hear the gospel. True story. Someone who served in the Arabian Peninsula told me this story back in Houston, Texas one time. And I still remember the details and the reaction and the emotions that came from that person. This person was living there, and they were gathering for a Bible study every Friday night. And someone from the locals, who happens to be Muslim, obviously, was being curious about why is it that every Friday there are so many cars? The person probably is thinking there is a feast and a meal and food, and he wants to know about this. And the, the one who is inviting people to their home for the Bible study was concerned that what if the local, if they find out that we have in a church at my home, that they will tell the authority. And that person told me that one day they had this dream, that it was judgment day. They were standing before the throne of God. And she in that dream, here we go, I said she. So she in that dream saw that person, the neighbor, pointing at her and telling God, she never told me. It is not fair that I will be judged. She never told me. Apparently, he was saying, I never heard this gospel that you're judging me by because my neighbor never revealed it to me. And I remember that person telling me. She said, you know what? From that day forward, I never ceased from sharing the truth about Christ with anyone that comes to my mind or comes to my past. And she shared that truth also with this person. And guess what? He began to attend. He was curious about the Bible study. His reaction wasn't to go and tell. His reaction is go and learn. And sometimes we don't know 
unless we initiate. So the disciples basically had gone away to the city, to the town, to buy him food while he was there at the well. And this Samaritan woman comes and said to him, Who is it that you, though you are a Jew, that's number one, are asking me for a drink, though I am a Samaritan and a woman also? I mean, you understand the baggage that she's carrying? Not only am I a Samaritan and you Jews have issues with us, but I'm also the lowest of the lowest. I'm a woman. And yet you as a man who's a Jew have no problem asking me and dialoguing with me directly. Jesus' behavior made her curious about that. Made her wonder about the person that is dealing with her. You and I will have these opportunities also. People have presuppositions about us. They assume things about us. I remember when I first came to the States as a Muslim, I have these presuppositions that America is a Christian nation. Go ahead and laugh now. Are we really a Christian nation? Knowing what I know about Christianity today, we are far from it as a nation. That doesn't mean we don't have pockets of believers, but that was my presupposition. And yet, people also thought, because I am from Saudi, that I own an oil field. I laughed my, basically so hard, it's like, really? Really? If I own an oil field, I won't be here right now. People have basically these presuppositions. They think about us. In fact, they even thought I live in a tent and I drive a Mercedes. Now, they weren't really far off from the Mercedes thing, but I wasn't living in a tent. They think we live in the desert. There are no high rises. Those are people who have never been to Saudi, obviously. I get it. I understand. They're watching a lot of movies that give them that perception. And I was watching a lot of movies also that were giving me these perceptions. One of the things that drew me to Christ is the attitude of the family that I encountered for the first time who were born again believers. Their love for me, their kindness towards me. In fact, both families that God used in my life showed that. And guess what? In the next two weeks, I'll be meeting with both of them for dinner. God can use people in our life to draw our curiosity and open the door for discussions. And that's exactly what happened in the life of this woman. I'm just paying attention to the timer because I'm known to go over sermons by an hour. So <laughs> you can cancel your lunch appointments if you like. So we need to use a common point of interest or contrast in order for us to be able to begin the dialogue. So she came to the well to draw water. Jesus is sitting by the well, and he's like, okay, can you give me water? And she's looking at him and surprised that he's even talking to her. And then he uses that opportunity and begin to talk to her about the fact that if you knew who is talking to you, you would be asking him for the living water. You see how Jesus basically opened the door for this conversation? There is always a way for us, by the way, to try to find anything that can open the door for our discussions. I tell people, Muslims have a lot of traditions and a lot of things. Open the door by talking about these things, asking about these things, so that you are able to contrast with them, whether it's prayer, it's fasting, it's honoring the elderly, and the list can go on and on and on, and we need to bring Christ and the Bible into it immediately. That's the whole point. So the second step or the second lesson we can learn is that we ought to uh, gain the trust and the confidence of the people that we are dealing with. They need to really look at us as someone who is friendly and peaceful, not someone who is hostile. To be honest, these days, there is a lot of hostility in the world, and people do know which side are you taking. Are you with them or against them? And I tell people, be honest. Even if you come from a viewpoint and you see that people within your own viewpoints that are being unfair, just share it and say it this way. Jesus obviously told the Samaritan woman, in, no, in an undirect way that I do not approve of my people's tradition not to go through Samaria. That's why I am going against the tide. 
and I'm coming through. That alone allowed her to be curious about him. There are many people, by the way, that have this perception about Westerners and Americans, and Christians for that matter. Are you in the process of changing, transforming their mind? Notice what the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed. By what? By the renewal of your mind. But before we get to the mind, the heart has to change also. Because what comes out of the mouth represents what the heart has in it and what the heart is producing. People see your heart through your actions. And that's the hope that we can do things like this to transform cultures. Our culture, by the way, is filled with a lot of man-made ideologies and etiquettes and things that boggle the mind sometimes. Every day, I go to news, basically, or Twitter, or Facebook, and I see things that I'm even surprised that people can think this way. But you know what? They're either appeasing others, want to fit in, they need approval, they want attention, or maybe they truly believe it. One way or another, this is a golden opportunity. You've heard your pastor right now says that the fields are ripe. The fields are plentiful. In fact, in this story, towards the end, Jesus tells the disciples, look, the fields are white. And you know what he was referring to? The Samaritans dressed up in white clothes. They were coming towards him. The fields are white. Pray that the uh, Lord or the, uh, the, the God of the, these fields, the Lord of the field, send or the harvest, send harvesters to collect from his harvest. We have a lot of fields around us that are ripe for the gospel. The question is, are we willing to go to these fields? If you're waiting for the fields to come to you, best of luck with that, okay? Ain't going to happen. Because first, people have their presuppositions about you. Sometimes there is com communication barriers, language barriers, cultural barriers, customs, and so many other things. But you initiating, go and make disciples. Notice what Jesus says. He didn't say wait and make disciples. No, go and make disciples. It's a go-to ministry. Anywhere you go. And please hear me out. I'm not asking you to sell your homes, pack up, and leave and go overseas. The going is everywhere around you. And today, I can stand before you and say the fields are in your backyard. Everywhere you go. And my hope is that we will capitalize on that. Jesus invaded the Samaritan woman's culture intentionally and wanted now to gain her trust so that the, she can carry on this conversation with him. And he began to reveal himself to her gradually. First, he was a Jewish man. Then slowly and gradually, she began to notice that this is a religious man. I perceive you are a prophet. And then at the end, oh, we're waiting for the Messiah. And Jesus is like, believe it or not, this is one of the rare times that Jesus revealed his identity. He says... The Messiah you're waiting for is the one who is talking to you right now. You see, Jesus didn't come in the first time and say, how dare you talk to me like this? Can't you see my name tag? I'm the Messiah right here. <laughs> no, it was his way of communicating with her, the way he revealed himself to her gradually. Granted, this is a quick story, but Jesus is telling us that even if it takes weeks or months, are people beginning to slowly and gradually understand your identity in Christ? You know what is the fastest way to tell people that you belong to Jesus? Is when you meet them for the first time, after talking with them, just ask them a question before you leave. My Lord asked me to pray for people. How can I pray for you? You think that's hard to do? You'll be surprised if you give them a way to send you prayer request. how often they're going to send it to you at 2 in the morning. <laughs> I just had an argument with my husband. Please pray for that. My kids are driving me nuts. Please pray for that. And then they begin to see the power of the name of our Lord. True story. One of the students from the Arabian Peninsula was in my state. And I was working with some people who are witnessing to them. And I said, please try this. 
and ask them to share with you if they even have nightmares uh, that you can pray over them. And they said one particular student can find to them that he's been having nightmares almost on a, on a nightly basis. And they began to pray with that student. And a week later, he says, I'm surprised. For a whole week, I didn't have any nightmares. How did you do it? You see, that opened the door to talk about the power of Christ. It wasn't them. It was the name of our Lord. It was Christ drawing this young man to know more and more about him. Jesus did a gradual revelation of himself. And he used phrases that are important. They're by the well, and the well will give you water. But he added living water. Something interesting, right? Because if he would have said, well, if you know who you're talking to, I'll give you my water. And she would have said, really, I have water right here. She was bragging about the fact that this is the will of Jacob. If she knew that this is the true Israel who's talking to her now. But all that to say when he says living water, that piqued her curiosity. She wanted to know, what do you mean by living water? Now, by the way, the Old Testament refers to God in this way oftentimes. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13. My people have committed two sins. This is the summary of the passage. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. This is God speaking to his people through the mouth of Jeremiah. They have forsaken me. And what is my identity? I'm the spring that gives them all the time living water. This is in reference to God. Water in the Bible represents, by the way, the word of God or a metaphor for our salvation and in particular to the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 7, by the way, verses 37 and 38, look what the apostle John says. He says, speaking of Christ, during a, festival, a specific festivity, he says, now on the last day of that festivity, by the way, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Notice, he's pointing to himself as the Savior. Let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me. You see, now there is a connection between water and believing. Technically speaking, to drink this living water is to believe in the one who gives it to you. And in this case, our Lord. So, the one who believes in me, as the scripture said, Jesus is tying it to a foundation. From his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is talking about you and me, by the way. Rivers of living water will flow out of us when we have the Holy Spirit in us. You are the source for that living water to the people around you. So we are not left alone. It is not exclusive just in this story to Jesus because he has empowered us and give us, given us his Holy Spirit to dwell in us and reveal this living water. And then John will say, and uh, uh, in verse 39, but this he, meaning Jesus, said in reference to the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So after Jesus was glorified, meaning went all the way to the cross, died, buried, and resurrected, he sent us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, the power from above to make us his witness in Jerusalem, all of uh, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Jesus didn't send us, didn't say go to all nations without the power of the Holy Spirit and without his presence with us. He says, and I will be with you until the end of the age. Now, the interesting thing about the Old Testament time is that the Holy Spirit will come upon people, empower them to do things, and then may depart. In our case, we have the Holy Spirit in us forever as a down payment and as a seal. What a privilege indeed that we in the New Testament age now have the Holy Spirit in us. We are the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We need to accept people, by the way, where they are. And that's what Jesus did. He began to have a dialogue with her. Of course, the story was condensed. Jesus knew what was going on in her life by way of sin. But I tell people, 
The best way to start any gospel conversation with anyone is focus on their need for salvation. You know why there are religions in the world? Because people acknowledge this sin and they just come up with their own way of atoning for it. But they must know that there is one guaranteed way and that's through the way of our Lord. So Jesus was talking to her and he asked her to bring her husband and she's like, well, I don't have a husband. He's like, well, you're correct. You're absolutely correct about that. Because you have five and then they divorced you because in that culture, the man will divorce. But now the one who's with you doesn't want to marry you, but he's living with you. And she's like, oh, I perceive you're a prophet. How did you know? You can always find things in people's understanding and worldview to try to point him to the need for Jesus. For instance, let's use the Islamic worldview. I tell him, you know, how do you atone for your sin? Well, I have to fast and pray and go and do this. And are you 100% sure that it was accepted? No, that's why I keep doing it. Okay, well, great. Let me show you what the book of Hebrews says, that Jesus did it once and for all. Let me show you what the Bible says about us being new creation in Christ. Let me show you what the Bible talks about, the assurance of our salvation. You see, sometimes you have to ask pointed questions to be able to point people to the need for the Savior. That doesn't mean they're going to accept Him. But guess what? You have planted a seed or two already, or watered a seed or two that they've been already planted in their life. The point is, they need to hear about the truth. Now, we need to accept people where they at. Meet them at their level. Don't judge them. We're all sinners, by the way. All have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. So no one is perfect. If someone tells you, I am perfect in Christ, run for your life. Because no one is perfect. Otherwise, why do we need the Holy Spirit to sanctify us? But yes, the aim is to perfect us. Yes, the aim is to make us like Him in the image of His Son. Absolutely. But we're not there yet. And we're always falling short of that perfection. The third lesson is you ought to confront culture with the truth. You see, here is what it gets tricky for us. We always like to use, you know, basically political correctness you know people tell me oh well you know i i can't hurt my friends feeling and say that they are sinners i'm like well yeah that's interesting let me tell you how much you love your friend you love them all the way to hell good job because that's what we do if you do not want to confront the sin in their life if you don't want to be truthful about who they are in the eyes of god and why they need a savior all you're doing is you are wearing a mask and you are pretending you love them, yet they don't know that they have a chance. They have the chance. They deserve the opportunity to hear the gospel. Whether they accept it or not, that's entirely their choice. But they need to hear the truth. Jesus confronted her sin. And on top of this, he made sure that she began to recognize her need for someone to take away that sin. So the first step basically in this process of sharing about sin and salvation is the recognition of someone's need for salvation. Let me tell you this, I studied counseling and I did a practicum and internship for over a thousand hours. And I have dealt with people who have marital issues, drug issues, personality issues. And you know the ones that I succeeded with? the ones who acknowledge they had a problem. If you don't acknowledge that you have a problem, I don't think any doctor in the world can heal you. Once you acknowledge, then you are on your road to recovery. And the second thing is, I have to bring myself down to their level and lift them up. Otherwise, if I wanna like make, sure, make myself be superior to them, I'll say, man, you look really terrible down there, you know? I can't believe that you are sick this way. Might as well just go and jump off a cliff. Imagine if a doctor says that to you. You walk into the doctor and say, oh my, you look terrible. Wow, what's wrong with you? Oh yeah, that's going to be comforting to me. I'm already not feeling well anyway. No, the doctor is always going to sit down and probably he recognized something in me the moment they walked in, but they just want to draw it out of me. Do you feel this way? Tell me more. How does it make you feel when you do this or that? Oh, okay, you know, have you had these symptoms? They're trying to help me process and acknowledge that I do 
deal with these issues. And the same thing when it comes to sharing the truth with people. On top of this, and this is my favorite, she pulled a religious thing on Jesus. She's like, well, you know, we worship God on this temple and this mountain. You guys worship God in Jerusalem on that mountain. And Jesus is like, what a boatload of baloney is that, okay? That's not how it works. It's not about this temple or that temple. It's not about this mountain or that mountain. It's about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It has nothing to do with a location. It has to do with the fact that you know the true God and you're worshiping the true God. Now, of course, in the case of the Samaritan woman, Jesus was kind of like pointing the obvious to her. You guys only believe in the five books of Moses. So definitely you have missed out on a lot of things for the rest of the Old Testament. Let me correct you now and tell you that it has nothing to do with this. And it has to do with the true God. Jesus was pointing to her that the time is coming soon when he himself is going to be glorified that now we have that ability to worship God in spirit. Of course, his Holy Spirit because God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth god dwells in temples not made by human hand by the way look at our body the last time i checked i cannot even plant one hair in my head i would love to but i can't so we are made by god we are the temple of the holy spirit that's where god dwells we worship god anywhere everywhere i'm not limited to a certain time to worship him or a certain direction to worship him I worship him all the time. And that was Jesus' point. Basically, Jesus was saying the worship of God would no longer be represented by a specific location. And the Samaritans in this case are not familiar with the truth and they're ignorant about it. Sometimes you have to confront, by the way, how people worship. I mean, people sometimes will tell you, oh, I, I believe that there is a Jesus, but, but he's one of those Two million idols. Really? You believe in the true God who is dwelling among idols? Why do you need him then if you have all these idols? How are these idols doing for you, by the way? Are you really happy with them? Are they really saving you from your sin? Of course not. Sometimes people need to be confronted. In love, of course. We have to share the truth in love. Salvation, Jesus is pointed out to something that was fulfilled. Is from the Jews. Point blank. It's coming from the Old Testament, through the lineage of Abraham, from the Jewish people, through the Jewish prophets. And guess what? I am the fulfillment of that. We have to really share the truth straightforward and in love. Now, true friendship with people must nurture their spiritual life. In other words, can you think for yourself for a second? Do you know of the people that do not know God in your life that you have encounter with, that you are befriending, that you are talking to, are really being impacted spiritually by you? Or is it just a material thing and a physical thing only? What is the return on the investment for the kingdom? Are they truly being impacted by the truth? And then Jesus, of course, went on to find a common bridge in verse 25 where she acknowledged that they are waiting for the Messiah. But Jesus is like, okay, well, guess what? I am that Messiah. Muslims, by the way, acknowledge Jesus to be the Messiah. But which Messiah are they acknowledging? They tell you, we love Jesus. Which Jesus are they talking about? They tell you, we believe in God. Which God do they believe in? You see, you have to find commonalities to be able to share the truth with them and enlighten them. Now, the fifth lesson is that you ought to be willing to risk rejection. And that's the number one reason why we tend not to share with people. You know what people tell me? Well, I need to take a couple of seminars on Islam, and I need to go to seminary, and I think I need to really attend a few sermons on that. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, that's what exactly Satan wants you to do. To have a checklist and keep saying, check, 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 and Satan will keep telling you, oh, did you hear about this online seminar? It's fabulous. It will take you five more years to become an expert in the field. The idea is, don't keep delaying. 
Don't keep delaying. You have the Holy Spirit of God in you. You have the Word of God. Get plugged into Bible studies. Get plugged into the church. Learn how to share the truth with people instantaneously because you have the most powerful tool in you, the Word of God and His Holy Spirit. Rejection is not a problem. You are not going to lose your salvation if you get rejected. I'm rejected by my own family. I didn't lose my salvation over that. I'm rejected by my own cousins. I'm rejected by my own friends. It doesn't take the joy of God away from me. It hurts. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that somehow I should cease from sharing the truth just because of that. Many of us are going to be faced with rejection. It's pride that gets in the way. This woman really had two choices. Either have faith in Christ or reject the invitation. Guess who's going to lose at the end of the day? Not me. The woman will lose. The person that you're sharing with. And they need to hear the truth. If you reject, here's what's going to happen. There is going to be judgment day. Many people believe in that. And on judgment day, you're going to give an account to what I just shared with you. You ought to inspect and investigate the truth that I shared with you. I'm not going to convert you. The Holy Spirit of God will convict you and convert you. But you need to allow the work of God in your life. As a result of this, then we get the ultimate transformation. And that's to transform not just one person, but think about it. One person at a time adds up to the entire culture being transformed. God uses the few to transform the masses. In this case, the woman who's a sinner who finally accepted Christ, Christ didn't say, but you know what? You're not qualified yet because you have to go to my seminary first, okay? And then I want you to go and share the gospel. No, she was on fire already, went to her own village and she said, guys, I have some exciting news. I just met a guy who knew about all of my sins and he will tell you about your sins also. And I cannot wait to hear about your sins. <laughs> Would you like to come with me and find out? And they're all like, oh yeah, that's exciting. Let's go and find out. And they all went with her. He didn't say, oh, nah, Super Bowl, I'll be watching it, okay? I'm not interested. No, they all went. And on top of this, they said, we're going to go because we believe in your war, but we ought to check it for ourselves. You see, that's exactly the intent. People's life will transform and change, but they also have a responsibility to inspect it for themselves and that's exactly what happened and at this point his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman wow what an attitude okay oh he's speaking to a woman what are you seeking okay and why are you speaking with her so the woman left her water uh, water pot and went into the city and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is he? And she, she's acknowledging they left the city and were coming to him. And on top of this, they asked Jesus if he can stay with them for two more days. And what did Jesus' response was? Well, let me check with my secretary. I think I have a couple of engagement in the next two days. No. He says yes made himself available, spent two more days with them, and what happened? The whole village believed. Are we making ourselves available for people? You know, these days you can make yourself available in a variety of ways. Email, Zoom, in person, you name it. But we ought to make ourselves available because people are thirsty for the truth. They just need you to feed them that truth and support that truth. And their reaction was, isn't he, this man really is the savior of the world? Jesus is not just our savior. He's the savior of the world. The world needs to hear about him. He's not just our savior. He is the savior of all nations. All cultures and nations need to hear about him. Jesus himself said the following, in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And I promise I'll, I'll be done in two minutes. This verse right here in John 15, 13 brought my wife down to her knees and accepted Christ. When I met my wife for the first time, she has been a believer for three years. And she was saved by three methods. 
that I wouldn't have basically recommended anyone to use. People attack the character of Muhammad to her all the time. I never uh, basically recommended this, but it worked with her. And someone gave her a track at the uh, subway station. I never recommended people giving tracks. And then they took her to a movie as well. And the movie prompted her to hear this statement from the mouth of Christ. And then she began to read the Bible and she finished the whole Bible in three months. I went to seminary for six years to finish the Bible. That's how lazy I was. <laughs> but all that to say is like every morning I look at my wife and thank God that he saved her with the three methods that I was never intending to use. It's almost like God is saying in your face, my friend, I can use anything. Never underestimate the power of God. Here is what Jesus says in John 15, 14, the next verse. You are my friends if you do what I commanded you. Brothers and sisters, are we doing what Jesus has commanded us? To go and make disciples of all nations? Are we trusting that he will be with us until the end of the age? Because if we do, he says that we are his friends. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. For blessing us, Lord, with this amazing story. A story, Lord, that sometimes we wonder, why was it embedded in your word? But yet it is rich with so many lessons for us to learn. Lessons that are relevant to our culture today. To our worldviews today. To everything that we come across today. So, Father, we pray that every person who is here or watching this or will be watching it later that they will be a conduit to transform cultures by your power, trusting in you, in your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit, revealing Christ and his character in their lively interactions with people who are thirsty for the truth and helping him reach that final conclusion that God, our God, is seeking true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. We ask all of this in the power of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.